this groove payment is really a challenge for these tires. I don't know if it's the alignment of the tires, but it's constantly jockeying side to side. It doesn't really, on that groove pavement, it's not really a pull like it, the alignment thing normally is that I've been feeling. It's more of a side to side shift really fast, like left right, left right, left right, uh, as it's following these grooves. So something with the tread pattern of these tires is really uh, susceptible to the, the groove pavement. It might just be the tread pattern or the particular width or something. Just something to be mindful of and get used to. Until alternate tires are available for this, obviously. Now here, that, that rapid side to side goes away because it's not grooved. And then now here it is again. Shift, 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 shift. On all the bikes that I own, the only one I've really noticed it on this screw pavement as pronounced as the rider is on the scooters that have the very narrow tires. Dude, I am going to pass you. I'm tired of being in the blind spot. Uh, that's another thing about Houston drivers. They don't like to let you pass them. That whole, I'm going to be in front thing. Anyway, uh, the narrow scooter tires really have a hard time with these grooves. Uh, and not the big one, not the seam, but the actual grooves. Uh, it makes the bike twist and ride underneath you. Uh, the motorcycles, they've got a wide enough contact path that doesn't really bother them, but uh, uh, the scooters with the narrower tire feel it. This biker seems to feel it quite a bit too. Super aggressive if you want to get in there. Nobody's gonna let you. I don't know if you can see my mirrors, but anytime you want to change lanes or you've got a, a closing distance between you and another car, whoever's in the other lane is gonna nail the gas and try to box you in. And then once they box you, they bracket it. If they don't move, they just stay right there to hold you in that spot. It's really annoying. show up on the, uh, the camera, but we've got a pretty good uh, cold front that's blowing in. I think tonight, tomorrow, it's going to get a little, uh, a little chilly, have a lot of rain. So I may or may not do the Riker in the Rain video. There's one other uh, YouTube uh, reviewer that did the Riker in the Rain, and I think he was a, uh, I think he's a dealer, because he was riding it out from a dealer floor. But anyway, he did a very, very good video on uh, the, uh, how to ride your hand with the rain and uh, his experience with tracking and uh, puddles and ruts. Uh, it was very, very informative. I, was, I like that. Definitely gave him a thumbs up. Uh, I fully plan on riding this thing in rain or shine, but I'll probably keep the rain stuff to a minimum while the alignment is still a little bit wacky. I think I have to deal with. I think the extra resistance of running in uh, rain ruts will really make this thing pull pretty hard side to side, so I won't press my luck. Another thing I'm going to get, uh, that's a, a good one right here, this traffic situation uh, illustrates it perfectly. When you roll off on the throttle on the right there, there's so much engine braking that you're essentially slowing down like a brake uh, would give you on most bikes or definitely in a car. Uh, I'm going to add the uh, add more uh, third brake light. I forget the proper product name for it, but it's their light bar. Uh, that has integrated uh, progressive turn signals, flashing brake light, and it has an accelerometer in it uh, to where it will flash for uh, drivers behind you to let you know that you're slowing even if you haven't touched the brake. It's a huge benefit in uh, heavy traffic, especially with the way the big cities, uh, you've got the tailgaters and the fact that this thing slows down so rapidly without even using the brake. Great for sport riding and uh, great for 
observing your uh, brake pads, but not so great when you've got somebody right on your tail. I think I said it earlier in another part of the video, but you know, normally on a bike, it's uh, always a recommended practice. Most veteran riders uh, will always cover the front brake with a couple of fingers, and uh, when you're in a heavy traffic, traffic situation like that, or you've got tailgaters, you always uh, stand your brake a little bit, you tap the, tap the lever to flash your brake light and let them know you're slowing down or that there's a, a caution in front of you. Uh, it just becomes motor memory after years and years of riding and, and close calls and everything. You always want to tap your brakes, let people know. You always check your mirrors before you jam the brakes as well. You don't want to end up being a good ornament. In almost any case, a motorcycle, uh, or in this case a trike, will be able to outbrake a car. You've just got so much less mass to slow down. So, uh, by virtue of outbreaking them, you are placing yourself in harm's way. Always got to pay attention to what's behind you. I never go more than, I don't know, two seconds, three seconds uh, on average without flirting my eyes left and right. Uh, and like situations like this, I am watching my mirrors like a hawk because somebody sometime will uh, miss calculate their speed to distance or just flat not be paying attention and come screeching up behind you and if you're not ready to squirt to an alternate lane you're stuck in the sandwich game and of course the riker being wide you can't just jump it between cars like you can a bike that's saved me three or four times in my riding career being able to jump to the shoulder or jump between two other vehicles and let the, the one that was screeching up behind me hit the vehicle that i was sitting behind so that illustrates the sandwich principle. Uh, the Riker's a, a different animal, obviously. A little too wide to do the uh, jump out of the way bit, so that makes the uh, evasive action harder. Uh, you could still try to squirt it up on the shoulder to the left. Probably not going to get it between cars, at least not here in Houston. Uh, in the worst case, if you really wanted to take the chances, you could try to bail off the bike that's not going to be a good situation either unless you can jump really out of the lane and just playing back a couple of scenarios where I had to evade real quickly like that on big touring bikes and things uh, always leave the bike in gear obviously the Riker doesn't have a gear so you're ready to whack that throttle at any second but uh, you always leave the bike in gear you're always watching your mirrors you're always ready to move in case of an emergency uh, and that includes planning your contingency, your escape route, uh, and uh, minimum of four times, five times or older, uh, that little trick has saved me uh, serious bodily injury. Worst one was a uh, case years ago in Oklahoma. Uh, I had some guy in a uh, Buick station wagon not paying attention to traffic. Everybody's sitting still at a red light. I'm about four cars deep in the left lane, or the middle lane, the left lane of the turn lane. Uh, and I'm on a, a full dress Honda Goldwing interstate. And I'm sitting behind a, a truck, rearmost in traffic at the light. And this guy in the uh, Buick station wagon, hauling ass, not paying attention, 50 miles an hour up on the stop traffic, and didn't realize it until the last second, locks the brakes. I look in the mirror, see him, hear him squealing the tires right up to where I'm sitting, and uh, luckily I had it in gear, revved it, dumped the clutch, just about washed the bike out from under me, but I managed to scoot up behind, or between the two cars that I was sitting behind, uh, and the truck that I was sitting behind ended up getting sandwiched all the way up to almost the cab of the truck, so the whole tail, you know, the whole uh, bed of the truck was collapsed from that station wagon hitting it. I ended up getting hit and knocked over uh, at a standstill because the truck bumped into me from the impact and uh, toppled me into the other car, but could have been a whole lot worse. Plenty of other of those occasions uh, all over Oklahoma, Texas.
Texas. I uh, had one in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Similar situation. Bad road conditions. Guy wasn't paying attention. Luckily, I was. Uh, and I ended up evading to the shoulder, and this guy slid and spiraled and took out four cars that I was behind. Wow. Another thing that I'm going to add, uh, it'll make me look like the uh, ultra uber geek commuter, uh, but I've enjoyed it on one of my other scooters, uh, my Silverwing. I found that that Silverwing, the mirrors on it, the shape of the mirror is something. I have uh, blind spots uh, more so than other bikes. It could have been a you know, function of my riding habits, or I don't know, but I always found that I would uh, have cars hiding uh, off of my flank and just not see them. So I got a mirror, it's called Rider Scan. Um, I believe they're a UK company. Uh, I'll, I'll give a full review and some links to that. It's really cool. It's a little parabolically shaped, uh, convex shaped uh, mirror that has adhesive mounts that allows you to pivot it up and down, but it gives you pretty much a 180 degree view on the bike. It does take some practice to interpret it because we're not used to seeing mirrors in that shape. So the uh, uh, the images are a little distorted. Uh, it's almost like the 360 degree cameras. You know, you can watch those videos on YouTube and you can kind of figure out a little bit what's going on. But until you watch them a little while, uh, discerning you know what's where and spatial relationships are a little tricky. Uh, anyway, the uh, the rider scan. I'll put it you know just above the instrument cluster on hopefully on the uh, fixed part of the sport windshield that way when the screen is going up and down uh, it won't affect the, the height or whatever anyway I'll show you that it's a really neat piece of kit uh, I, I don't remember if it was very expensive I think it was 40 or 50 bucks uh, it is mail order or internet order only uh, I think it came from overseas so it was a couple weeks to get it um, anyway, very neat tool. Uh, it allows you to see somebody 
uh, you know, directly next to you just by looking in the mirror itself. Uh, and obviously anything over your shoulders, around you, whatever. Uh, a very, very good uh, traffic safety tool. Uh, some police departments, I understand, were putting them on their bikes, uh, you know, on the Harley full dress and stuff, just up near the uh, the instrument cluster uh, to help officers, uh, you know, patrol officers have a little better visibility uh, for their corners and whatnot, cover their six, cover their blind spots. Being able to sit back at the lights and relax is so cool. <laughs> On a, on a motorcycle, I never even sit there with, uh, with the bike in neutral. It's uh, not, not smart in Houston. So, you've always got your hand on the clutch. Being able to just lean back against the top case and relax, gather your thoughts. quite a bit it really shakes the handlebars and the mirrors and everything but yeah, it's no big deal uh, it's personality um, but I was curious to see what kind of RPMs it was running on the highway and I, I neglected to look uh, so I'll have to go back on the tape and the video and watch and see what it's doing uh, just out of curiosity just to kind of watch how it holds a uh, particular RPM relative to speed uh, all of my other big scooters that I've had I kind of know where those engines hover my silver wing, for example, at uh, 75 miles an hour, it's turning uh, just a tick under 6,000 RPM, uh, and I kind of know how to gauge the gas mileage or fuel economy on that one just on where the uh, the tack is sitting. Uh, if you get it up above 6,000 RPM, it starts to drink gas kind of fast just because of the fuel map and air resistance, of course. But it, it's pretty. Uh, pretty evident that once you get it over 6,000 RPM, it definitely changes to a new map uh, because it'll it'll drop about five miles to the gallon almost right away. Uh, if you keep it under 6,000 RPM, it's a much more efficient, uh, somewhere between 5,500 and 6,000. It just purrs along and you get really good fuel economy, like 52, almost 54. Uh, and that's good for a 600cc parallel twin. It's not bad at all, uh, with a CVT anyway. Now my uh, CB500X, my CB500F, the naked version of it, those are 473cc uh, parallel twins, something in that neighborhood. They, uh, they're they crazy efficient. They get high 60s, low 70s all day long. Uh, the only time I see worse economy out of them is uh, on the highway at really high speed or going into a headwind or something like that. I think the worst I've gotten out of my 500X was uh, high 40s, like 48, 49. And that's when I was uh, running 80 plus into a headwind going to Oklahoma and it was drinking it full of luggage, everything. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty much pulling a sail, cinder block in the wind. Yeehaw, there's that clunk, man. It clunks hard. If you get on it from a stop, it'll whack back there. I'm anxious to get my greedy little hands on a uh, factory service manual and see what they say about, or you know, look at the exploded diagrams and whatnot. Um, I want to see what's back there. Uh, if there's a clutch in that rear end, or if it's just ringing pinion and reduction gears and whatnot. Uh, it's just a curious sound. As long as nothing's being damaged, I don't care. I'll get used to it. I had to replace, uh, Get over there. I had to replace the rear end in a Suzuki Bergman 650 many, many years ago, a final drive anyway, uh, because of slack gears and lash in the drive line, um, and, uh, and plenty of cars, race cars, and you know, both front drive, rear drive didn't matter. Whenever you start hearing groaning and winding and gear gnash like that, it means that there's uh, too much slack in something. So, 
I had this uh, thought as I was driving out this morning and having it coming back. If anybody uh, has any suggestions on uh, recording equipment, uh, anybody that you know uh, is a, a blogger or content producer, uh, or if you're a content producer, uh, let me know. Give me some ideas on uh, microphone and uh, particularly editing software, because I'm having real nightmare time with uh, GoPro's free software, the, the studio uh, editor. It, it's always crashing, it's corrupting footage. Uh, every time I trim footage or split footage into two pieces, generally the uh, resulting clip right near the end of it will be corrupted, and as soon as the, the encoder reaches it or the playback uh, engine reaches it, GoPro Studio barfs. It, it hard locks and just sits there and I've waited 24 hours for it to recover. It doesn't recover. Uh, you have to force kill it, wait for the process to die, then go out and delete the file that you were encoding at that time and try it again. And usually what I have to do is further split that trimmed bit of video uh, to dump off the end of it. Something in the, uh, uh, the trailing portion of the data file is corrupted and it creates the problem. So, I'm looking for better software, better equipment, and I'll be able to do this a little bit better. Uh, do time compression, dynamic speed up, slow down, that kind of stuff, uh, just to get a better product on the video. Uh, I don't mind spending a little bit of money, uh, as long as it's not ridiculous, thousands of dollars or something like that. Uh, I've already ordered a microphone that I think is going to work really well. Uh, Troy Cian, I think this is how to pronounce his name, with uh, Motorcycle.com. He did a review recently on a uh, 3D printed uh, foam filled microphone for the front chin bar uh, of Moto Helmets. It's what they use in their videos and they uh, they liked it. They spoke pretty highly of it. It was only 30 bucks or 40 bucks or something like that. So I ordered a couple of them, one for my helmet, one for my son's. and. Uh, We'll give that a shot. I don't know if it's the answer or if it's just uh, something to try. Uh, I do plan on getting a professional audio recorder, uh, probably a Zoom. Was it the H4N, H5N multi-track? Uh, so I will wear it or hold it in the tank bag or something like that, and. Uh, one track will be uh, in-helmet audio, another track will be uh, Bluetooth uh, communicator. We'll probably get a, another Cardo and hack up the uh, audio connectors and feed that straight in so it's part of the conversation. Then uh, I will probably place one or two mics on the bike. If I could find a PZM, which is a pressure zone mic, I'll hang one off the bike near the exhaust or maybe near the rear end get that noise on the rear end on uh, audio so everybody can make their opinions on it and then uh, you know of course get the engine and exhaust note and then mix them in at my uh, preferred levels get some much better audio because uh, <laughs> my previous videos don't have good audio anyway I'll catch you all later thanks